Hi, my name is Jeff Harlig. I'm the director of the Cal State San Marcos Writing Center. What you're about to see is one of a series of videos on writing prepared with San Marcos faculty. In this series, you'll hear faculty from several departments on campus talking about the whole range of the writing process. In my years as a teacher and counselor, it's become clear to me that when students get a writing assignment, they often don't really know what's expected of them. They may not know why they're writing, and they may not know what the finished product is supposed to be like. For that reason, I decided to talk directly to faculty and ask them questions like these. Why do you ask students to write? What are your expectations for writing, especially as regards the conventions of your own field? And finally, what's the role of writing in your own life and work? Our hope is that some of the mystery of the writing process can be cleared up by hearing answers to questions like these from the people who know best. Let's listen in now. Yeah, that's a question I get a lot. It is, okay, I'm getting a degree in business. This is all about dollars and cents. We tend to think about accounting, finance, investments, stock market, operations management, efficiency, percentages, bell curves. So what does writing have to do with any of that? You know, when we hear the word writing, you know, we're thinking about Hemingway, et cetera. Shakespeare. Uh, and the bottom line really is communication. And over years now, decades in fact, I've met so many really bright or brilliant students in business uh, who unfortunately, some of them, have a real difficult time in communicating what they know. And the written word is so important as a lasting record uh, as opposed to spoken word. You know, the written word is down forever. And your ability, one's ability to communicate this in writing in the business world is essentially critically important. Uh, that's why in my courses, even if they're quantitative, I try to really make a huge deal out of this idea of quality writing. Uh, I think quality writing also telegraphs to the world or to any of your readers that you're an educated person. You are not just someone coming in off the street. You're not out of a grade school or junior high classroom. You, know, you are a highly educated person and your writing should be indicative of that. And it, it telegraphs important messages uh, to business people. PowerPoint's great. Uh, in my professional career, I used it many, many times. I still do use it. That said, I don't use it a lot. I really try to dissuade uh, students from using PowerPoint as a substitute for quality writing, which unfortunately, I feel it, it sort of has become that in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, PowerPoint is great for its intended uh, purpose, and that would be to help make points uh, as you're discussing something, or even integral to some kind of written document, charts and graphs in PowerPoint, to also help make your written points. But when it's sort of a, the, when the tail starts wagging the dog, the PowerPoint is taken over is as a substitute for high quality professional writing. As a business person, professional, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a substitute for detailed professional writing. Uh, so on one hand, I love it for what PowerPoint is and what it can do, especially in graphics, diagrams, et cetera, summaries, uh, bullet points. Uh, I think the danger is in making PowerPoint a substitute for high quality professional writing. And in Microsoft's defense, it was never intended to be that. I think we're into uh, chicken or the egg. That is, it's no, there's no doubt attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. Um, I could open and close my case with the example of Twitter, enough said. 
that is so limiting in characters. To a professional writer, let's call it what it is, Twitter is practically an insult to a, to a true professional writer. It's uh, akin to comical, basically. Um, again, for its intended purpose, to tweet is an entirely different sort of objective than a serious, professionally written journal article. I mean, the two couldn't be further apart. Uh, society, at least the Western world, probably the Eastern world too, the tendency seems to be to go faster and faster, more superficial all the time. Now, faster should not be confused with better. And this is another area where I think particularly young people get a bit confused. And of course, through prodding from Madison Avenue, marketing, et cetera, uh, our society in general. Everything seems to be going faster. I think the question to ask is, are things actually better? A well-written professional document is highly detailed. It includes a great amount of thinking, oftentimes a, a substantial amount of critical thinking. It may include references, uh, past articles. These are very important tenets uh, for a professional document to stand the test of time. There is no way you can equate that to a tweet. Students are always asking for samples. Well, what do you want exactly? And it's a fair question from their perspective. One difficulty with it is in the real business world, you know, students are always complaining that the classroom is not like the real world. Well, oftentimes, if an instructor tries to make it more like the real world, guess what? Students don't like that either. They might like it less. In the real world, uh, very rarely will you get an opportunity to see a sample of exactly what your boss wants to see. So there's sort of a pro and con to showing examples to students. I think it's important to give students a fair roadmap, a rough idea of what you expect to see, some kind of outline. Uh, to put everyone sort of on a level playing field for a written assignment. Uh, that to me seems very fair and logical. I'm on the student's side, I want them to do well. Uh, I, there's nothing to be gained or any faculty member wants to see their students do poorly. It should not be a game of cat and mouse between the teacher and the student. Uh, I'm on the student's side, I want them to do well. I think giving them some kind of limited sample or certainly some kind of outline of what we expect a particular paper to look like. I think within limits, it's a good thing. The danger would be in providing the students with so much detail, you've taken a lot of the potential creativity out of the assignment. That is, I'd like to give them a rough outline and have the students fill in the blanks. Have them give me some new ways of looking at it or some kind of different perspective or to throw in something that wasn't specifically asked for but still fits. That is to try to nurture along their creativity as well as strictly what I want to see in a paper. Now they might include something I wasn't expecting that makes the paper astoundingly better. And that's great for any instructor to see. Years of trial and error teaching, years of finding out exactly where those boundary lines are as I create that avenue for them to drive down. Um, too wide, no good either, they get lost. Too narrow, okay, they're giving me exactly what I want, but all they're doing is jumping hoops. Uh, I'm not seeing enough creativity, which is, wouldn't be their fault if my boundaries were too narrow. It's my fault. So somewhere in between too wide and too narrow, is I think a good writing assignment. The analogy I use often is uh, I like to give them a wide avenue and then let them drive down it any way they wish. So I like to give them broad limits but then give them a lot of leeway to be creative within those limits. I don't want to tell them precisely what I want.
what's really important in the business world are what are generally called executive summaries. And these are documents that, be writ that would be read by CEOs, COOs, top management, otherwise VPs, et cetera. And these would be, in essence, um, relatively brief summaries of um, many details that may be following in a much thicker, longer report. Mm -hmm. The detailed reports tend to be read by middle management, um, team leaders, groups, et cetera. CEOs can't be bothered with a 300-page document. They're just not going to read it, regardless of what might have even been paid uh, for that report. So an executive summary is very important in that regard to make these summary points very quickly and directly. Here might be where you'd interject a PowerPoint or two or three to graphically make some of the major points that are in your written executive summary. Obviously, I think goes without saying, spelling, grammar, punctuation, yes, these things count when a CEO of a corporation or one of your clients is reading something you wrote. Another issue, we get questions from students all the time if spelling, grammar, punctuation count toward you know, the grade. And my answer invariably is yes, they certainly do. Um, in other kinds of business situations, you may have massively long and detailed written reports. These would be true in highly detailed market research studies, focus group uh, report written uh, from a moderator. And here, the most, the most precise detail would be desired uh, by your reader. So in these situations, quite opposite from an executive summary, you want to include every last detail uh, as possible uh, because many times there can be tremendous information between the lines within all of this detail. Some very big management decisions can come from these detailed reports. There are lots of different writing styles, many of which are acceptable in the world of business. Certainly for um, doctoral dissertations, back to academia for a minute, we invariably see uh, APA style, uh, occasionally Turabian writing style. Uh, University of Phoenix, to quote another school, entirely APA style in all of their business school written requirements. Uh, Academy of Management, American Management Association, American Marketing Association, Decision Sciences Institute, they all have basic guidelines for writing. This would be for their respective journals. Now, these styles are not all radically different from each other. They have much more in common than they have differences. Uh, and all of them really tend to go back to APA or Turabian. Uh, Chicago uh, mm -hmm. style manual, also very big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are the big guns out there. And there are no radical differences in writing styles that are professionally accepted. Where we get into problems in, at the university level are, would be in areas in which students, for some reason unknown, want to invent their own writing styles. And this really is, it's like trying to reinvent the wheel. It's just not necessary. And students unknowingly are making the writing assignment a lot harder. That is, all these rules are already in place, just follow them. It would be good, uh, if it's unclear, to find out what writing style your teacher is supporting or is looking for. Uh, but very few teachers would encourage a student to invent their own writing style. When students are inventing their own writing style, invariably things go astray. That is, the formats are not kept consistent from start to finish of the same paper. This is the whole point of a writing style in the first place, is to define for you ahead of time how should you set this up. The idea is to make it easier for you to write, not harder. Any outline coming from the teacher's side, that is presumably to help a student complete a paper, um, we're sort of back to the avenue again, wide or narrow. That is, the outline should be a roadmap to help a student understand 
probably the best order to take things in. An outline helps that student organize their thoughts. The outline should not create the student's thoughts. That needs to come from the student themselves. So the outline would serve the purpose to provide a general roadmap. Here's the order that you should probably take things. Helps organize one's thinking, but should not be a substitute for their thinking. This, of course, is something presumably we've tried to get students into back in uh, junior high, certainly high school. Create your own outline and then stick to it. Follow it. Most of the time, I would say for students, spend more time on the outline, less time on actually writing it, which might sound a little crazy. But if you've got a good outline, a good roadmap, I think you can probably write just as good a paper in less time. You've got that solid roadmap. You're not going to ramble around. Uh, getting one's thoughts down, getting the order of those thoughts that would make most sense to the reader, very, very important. On their own, whether they would receive one from the instructor or not, on any written assignment, they should be creating or at least having some kind of outline to go by, whether they got it fed to them or they created it on their own. Let me state it a slightly different way. Trying to write any kind of paper, professional or academic, uh, without an outline, you've got to be really good, experienced. You've got to be writing daily to be able to pull that off, in my estimation. It can be done. You really have to be a top-notch writer to do it. For myself, that is uh, speaking as a sample of one, I'm looking for creative and critical thinking. I'm not looking for the buzzwords or the keywords as uh, necessary for a great paper in and of itself. If they can use certain buzzwords or keywords within the context of explaining in their own words the issue, then that's very good. But I really want to hear what's inside their head. What I don't want to see are long or short quotes, particularly long quotes, from other people. Uh, it's fine if it helps support the student's point of view. References used in support of what the student's trying to tell me. I don't like to see long and short quotes used as part of the body of the paper. Um, so there's that issue. I like to see creative thinking from the student. Many times they'll relate it to their own work experience, their own life experience. Uh, they'll bring that into the paper to help make one of their points. I think that's excellent. If they can take a, a life experience personally or a work experience uh, from their life and integrate that to help make their point in this assignment, this written assignment, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I also look for a lot of syntax. That is, is this a paragraph that's going for six and a half pages? I'm getting real tired reading this. You know, I need a, I need to, my eyes need a break. Paragraphs were invented for a reason. Uh, spelling, punctuation, an occasional error. Yeah, sure, we've all done that. It's understandable. It's okay. Repeated errors are not okay. That is, a student's telegraphing a message. I didn't bother reading my paper through, but now I want you to read it. So those things are kind of negative warning signs. Uh, overall, a lot depends on the assignment itself. But mostly, I'm looking for creative thinking combined with good writing skills. When I'm done reading the paper, do I have to read it again to get it? Or can I read it once and say, even if I disagree with what the student's saying, that's immaterial, really. Am I getting it? Can I read it once and get it? That's a well-written paper. I would answer this in terms of time and place. 
And by that I mean there's a time and place for different styles of writing. That is, uh, you're leaving the note on the kitchen counter for your spouse. Okay, grammar, punctuation, spelling may not be all that important. With Twitter, you're held to this ridiculous character limit. So you're, in essence, by default, forced into using all these little acronyms. R and two and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, BTW and LOL and on and on and on. So, and in those contexts, it's fine. No problem. But you're not going to present a paper for the American Marketing Association, a national annual convention, using that same type of writing style. So, as your audience becomes more professional and more demanding, the writer has got to meet that challenge if they want to be taken seriously. Uh, so it really comes back to this idea of basic communication. That is, if you're going to the Harvard Business Review uh, for some kind of or, uh, a uh, conference, uh, presenting a paper that was previously published or what have you, the standards are different, and they should be different. And to this day, they are very different. Uh, I don't see anyone writing in tweets at these types of national conferences or in any of the respected professional journals. Uh, so, to be taken seriously, you really have no choice. Now, the other part of your question, for students, uh, even, in, even juniors and seniors, even graduate students, this idea of uh, the importance of quality writing, I think, takes on even bigger proportions. Uh, the short answer is, I'm not sure what they can do. Can we go back to junior high and, you know, start going back over lessons from their teacher? I mean, who's really at fault here? It's hard to really fault a student right. if they were passed through 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. You know, who are we to come back later and say, well, you, you know, you got to learn how to write all over again. And whose job, whose role really is that? And where's the time going to come from? Uh, in my case, teaching quantitative methods, market research, operations management, I don't have time to go back and teach seventh grade paragraph structure. I can point out in a paper with some kind of, uh, some kind of mark on the paper, here, paragraph should be starting here. But I can't really teach all the ins and outs about it at that, at that stage. I would say this to students, again, the instructors, we're on your side. We want you to succeed. That's why we're in this profession. And somehow figure out how to become a better writer. Tutorials outside of the classroom, online, outside of the classroom, whatever it takes. I would say a successful communicator is going to have to learn how to effectively write to the level that their audience would expect. If the audience is high level, that would presume the person writing is aspiring in their career, they're writing for a higher and higher level audience, they've got to get their writing on a higher and higher level. Another thing that just by its very nature leads to good writing is more reading. And this is another area where, okay, are we reading condensed articles off of an iPhone, or are we reading serious written material out of a professional journal? And that is, almost always, the, the most proficient readers are the better writers. They see what good writing looks like. It sinks in consciously or otherwise. Uh, this can start preschool. You know, depend, I mean, how far back do we want to go with the discussion? This can really start with, with preschool. Uh, children motivated to read, invariably, the odds are they'll become much better writers. Conversely, students today seem to be reading less and less serious professional material. How can we expect the writing to be any better? 
So to all the instructors out there, I would say, what kind of reading are you assigning? Over time, this will lead to better writing. It's not an overnight fix. Well, a pop book is a lot more fun to read and a lot more fun to write. Uh, with a pop book, you can get away with a lot. Uh, you need to be, you still need to be clued in a bit to your audience. Uh, in a pop book, you don't really want to talk down to the audience. You don't want to inadvertently talk over their heads either. Uh, for a pop book, uh, use of humor can be very effective. Illustrations, sometimes comic type line drawings, depending on the subject matter of what's involved. So uh, your sentence structure, that is uh, paragraphs, the organization of what you're trying to explain in a pop book, all that pretty much stays the same, uh, whether it's pop or academic. So those are still fundamentally important. But you have more leeway in the types of words you could use and so on. One good example, maybe the best, would be use of slang. To a certain extent, slang in a pop book is almost expected. And it kind of relaxes your readership. I think it plays a good role. It can be used uh, very effectively for humor and so on. Uh, also in a pop book, once in a while you might throw in something that seems astray, sort of something offbeat or a curveball to the reader. So it sort of jolts them or says, oh, wow, where did that come from? Or it's something to maybe capture or rekindle their interest as you're going. Conversely, academically, these things would hardly ever be done. Uh, academically, you're held to a much stricter standard, although the creation of an outline, the, your writing structure, paragraphs, structure, etc., your train of thought, that all still needs to be there like a pop book, but you're really held and confined, if I could use that word, to a much more stricter set of guidelines. But it's for a reason, you know, for a more academic, more intellectual audience. The purpose of what you're writing in an academic paper is quite different. You know, we're really not trying to entertain. And in a pop book, we very much are trying to entertain. So that sort of changes the setting of the stage, you might say. Well, taken to the extreme, many students might think the pop audience is the only audience that's ever existed. And perhaps in their life and from their perspective and rightfully from their experiences, uh, maybe that is the only audience they've experienced. That is not really their fault if they don't see the difference between a pop audience and an academic audience. That is a teacher's responsibility from a really uh, earlier age, and certainly at the university level, for students to understand the difference. Okay, you can say, this is very cool in a pop type of paper, but you're not going to say that in a professional journal. And students at the college level need to begin to understand the difference in these audiences. The whole world is not a pop concert. You know, the whole world does have certain factions that are very intellectual, very high caliber. Their whole purpose, a reason for a group's existence, may be to push that particular art or science further. Um, research, for example. Uh, very high-end academic journals. The whole purpose is learning and greater knowledge through research. So we're into a very academic, very professional, very demanding intellectual crowd. This is different than comic book writing or tweets. Some students could potentially be very good writers if they found substitute words for the slang they're currently using, which they're bright enough to do. They just haven't thought about it and or they don't see the necessity for it if they don't understand that there is a higher audience that could be reading this. The problem is 
the use of slang when read by a higher caliber audience inadvertently drags that writer down. They're not taken as seriously. And okay, we can talk about what should and shouldn't be. You should judge a person on what they're thinking and not by how it looks. And that argument goes on for years, even for people in general. You know, judge me by who I am, not by how I look. And, you know, we've heard that for centuries. The truth is it doesn't always work that way. Whether we like it or not, we don't have to agree with the premise. People do judge you by the words you use. At higher levels of academia or professional uh, business life, people judge you by the words you use, speaking and writing. Writing is more critical because it's a permanent record. This was a big issue uh, when I was in college 30 years ago. It continues to be a big issue. With the onset of the internet, it's probably a bigger issue now than it's ever been. I mean, it's never been easier to cut and paste. Uh, it was done before, pre-internet. Yes, there was a time pre-internet. But never has it been more easy. Uh, I mean, we're talking a couple clicks of a mouse. Everyone knows how to cut and paste. There's a high road and a low road here in the discussion of plagiarism uh, to students. Um, the low road is to strike the fear of God into them, saying, I'm going to run this through all kinds of software, which is available, that checks for how much of this paper was copped from somewhere else. It's out there. Uh, many faculty will, can tend to use it. We can threaten our students and tell them we're going to run every paper through the software. What percentage of your paper was copped from another source? And it'll tell us that source. You can change a few words here and there. It's not going to matter. You're still going to get nailed. This software is pretty good uh, that can do this. Some students are not even aware this software exists. So there are countermeasures to plagiarism. And the software has become pretty popular amongst faculty, high school and college. So the low road would be to warn your students about this software and um, sort of hang that over their head. So this now becomes cat and mouse, uh, cops and robbers. You're going to try to cheat and I'm going to nail you, basically is the message here. And the student is thinking, you know, how much can I, you know, what's the least amount of work I can get for the highest grade? And the teacher is thinking, what's this student trying to pull and how can I catch them? And to me, this low road with regard to plagiarism in this case is just not what I wanted to base my lifelong career on. So there's a high road uh, with regard to plagiarism. And that is, okay, guys, we all know it's out there. I am not going to take on the role of policeman. I'll tell him that. Say, you've heard this before. You're cheating yourself. That is, would you go to the mall and buy all this clothing and then on the way home, power down your windows and start throwing out left and right everything you just bought as you're driving home? That is, you paid for an education. Why don't you want it? When you put it into material terms, new clothes bought at the mall now pitched out the window. They say, well, I never thought about it. I never thought about my education that way. I tell them, start. Start thinking about it that way because that's really what you're doing. You're, someone's paying this tuition. What is a grade? I can't tell you hardly any of my grades from when I graduated college. Now, how important is it really? You know, what you're learning and how you're improving, this is what college is all about. So if you want to cheat, I mean, if you're that hell-bent on it, there are ways around the cheat detect software. If you, you're going to spend more time doing that than if you just wrote the damn paper on your own. You probably get a fine grade if you're being creative. I mean, someone who's putting in all that creative energy to try to plagiarize has what it takes to write a great paper. They're the last ones that seem to know that, which yeah. is a real pity. Yeah. So take that energy 
and put it into your own original creative work and you're miles ahead. So I think on this one, it's entrusting the student, uh, showing them the respect that you're going to treat them like an adult, not like a cheating kid. And they respond very positively. Many of my students never really thought about the concept of an editor. That is, and for most of their assignments, they're solo, so they serve as the writer and the editor. It might even be considered cheating to have someone else read a solo paper and make suggestions or edit it actually for them. And many instructors might rightfully consider that cheating. It would depend on the assignment. Um, although I do understand the student's point of view, if they feel maybe they're not that great of a writer, it's a solo writing assignment, they feel the pressure is really on, it, it behooves them to have someone else read this paper and make suggestions, serving as an editor, uh, whether the assignment called for it or not. So I could see that point of view, given their situation under pressure, etc. cetera. Uh, in team assignments, uh, generally, Within a team, let's say of three to five to six people, students will self-identify who really feels their strongest, uh, a strong or the strongest writer, who maybe would be second or as good as the other. And maybe in a team of five people, you've got two people, the team self-identifies as good writers or better writers than the remaining uh, people in the team. Invariably, whether the instructor assigns it or not, in a team project, this is going to evolve. So you're going to end up with one or two people doing the bulk of the writing, one or two people doing the bulk of the editing. My point to the teams when it's a team assignment is don't have the editor be the same person as the writer. Don't edit your own work. You're too close to it. And they get that. I think they do tend to get that. And that system does seem to work quite well. Also, don't get married to what you wrote. Someone else changes it around. Don't get offended. If there's something you want to discuss or argue about within your team, that's a collaborative effort. That's good. Mm -hmm. I would actually encourage it. Maybe this is a better way to say it. Maybe it's not. Maybe the writer needs to take a step back and say, yeah, you know what? The person who edited my work, they're actually right. That is better. It is more clear. Maybe it's a consensus from the whole team. How many think this was a better way of saying it? So I think teams can be very powerful in that collaborative type effect. Also, it goes to the idea of the real world, where lots of assignments are team-oriented. A team produces a written report for a management or a CEO. So this idea of one person having the total responsibility of the final written product really is oftentimes not realistic in the real business world. Being an author myself, I wouldn't dream of publishing a book without multiple editors, actually. Uh, certainly me not being one of those editors. Different people reading my finished manuscript. Maybe it's not as finished as I thought it was. So that's a good thing. And to be open to that kind of uh, constructive criticism. Very important for students to learn that. to the students who are great writers, and there are a number of them. I've seen some astoundingly good papers. Uh, keep up the great work. It's very important, and don't let anybody tell you it's not. To those who feel like they're struggling with their writing, I would say self-improvement. Work on it. There's no, there's no magic bullet. Just work on it, uh, and that's a good thing. Work on it with a positive attitude continuously improve. And it will come back to you in very positive ways. The ability to communicate effectively with the written word will do nothing but help your career. It's a sign of an educated person. If you're not sure about assignments, you're writing, you have questions, problems, concerns, approach your faculty members, your teachers. Uh, because I sincerely believe they really are on your side. Teachers I know 
want to do everything they can to help their students be successful. And they're not just saying that. They're in this profession for a reason. So feel free to approach them. Don't be introverted. This is not the time for that. You paid for an education, get it. 